Welcome to Booktopia TV. I'm John Pensel, and I'm joined by Lauren Mucus to talk about her new book, Broken Monsters. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you. Now, to start off with, I just want to read a quote from a little-known author called Stephen King. Uh, he was talking about one of your, your latest book, Broken Monsters. Scary as hell and hypnotic. I couldn't put it down. That's no small message. No, as, as one of my friends said, it's, it's a bit like body slamming Hulk Hogan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you manage to scare Stephen King, lifetime achievement. It's, um, I, it's pretty wild. It blew my mind when I read that. It's and he tweeted it. It was, just, it was just, wow. It must be wonderful to think of, of these, these kind of writers reading your work. I mean, you've probably read his, their work over, over your, my entire life. your entire life and had a, had a sort of um, you know, big fans of them and then suddenly having these guys turn around and just go, you're, the, you're, you got, you're, you're it, you're doing the, exactly what I, what I want to read. It's, it's amazing. It's, and, and, and I think it's incredibly generous of those authors as well to actually, you know, like, go forward and blow other people's books and, and to pick out people that they really love. It's great to hear that, that, that such writers are big fan readers as well. Absolutely, definitely. So, um, Broken Monsters is a, a sort of a, a complicated book. There's a lot of things going on. Yes. It's a, it's a, I'm not, not saying that it's hard to read. I'm just saying that there's, a, there's lots of stuff going on. Can you tell me a bit, a bit about it? Um, it starts fairly simply with a body that is discovered in a tunnel um, of a half boy, half deer. He's somehow been cut in half and attached to the lower half of the deer. And the detective, Gabrielle Vis Visado, who's seen a lot of very strange cases in Detroit, who's just like, oh my gosh, what even is this? I can't believe I have to deal with this. And of course it gets worse from there. But it is, it is, somebody called it like The Wire meets Stephen King, and I think that's a really nice description because it has a, it has a big cast, and there are all these different lives in Detroit which kind of come together, um, and then strange things happen, even stranger than the opening. It's, uh, you know, one of them is a guy living homeless on the streets and trying to keep his kind of small family together. There is an artist who is dwarfed by this terrible ambition. Um, a blogger who's come out from New York trying to revitalize his journalism career and, and willing to go pretty far to do that. And of course, the, the relationship between the detective and her teenage daughter, who's getting into trouble online catfishing for pedophiles. Um, and all of these stories eventually do come together at the end. But I'm dealing with social media, I'm dealing with, um, you know, the end of the age of privacy, which we've just seen recently with these nude celebrity le uh, leaks. Um, but also how we live in the world and the kind of monsters we are inside or the monstrosities that we are capable of in our worst moments. Um, but also the people who have broken pieces and still find a way to live with themselves and still find a way to be good and to try and do good in the world. So, um Choosing Detroit um, as, as your backdrop, is that some sort of comment on, on America today? So Absolutely. I mean, I chose Detroit because it is the go-to metaphor for the end of our civilization. You know, it was the birth of the American dream with the motor industry, and now it's seen as the death of the American dream with all the foreclosed houses and the shutdown auto plants. And it's a very evocative place to go to and, and to walk around these ruins, which are our ruins. Um, you know, it's not the Acropolis. You're, you are standing in the ruins of our civilization. But of course Detroit is a lot more than that, and that's really why I wanted to go there, is to get under the skin of those easy cliches. 700,000 people still live there. It is, it is, for all that it is ruined and dilapidated, and there are huge swathes of empty land and boarded up buildings and ruined auto plants, it's also somewhere people live. And there's an incredible energy there. Um, and the artistic community and the young artists who are moving into the city and kind of making it their own, it's very exciting. It's a very exciting place. Um, you scared Stephen King and you scared, you scared <laughs> most, of, most of the readers. What, is there a certain delight in scaring a, scaring a reader? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. I've had a lot of people uh, email me or tweet at me to say that I've given them nightmares. Um, I feel a little bit bad about that. But, it, you know, I mean, you want someone to live so wholly in your world that you've created. You know, I think, I think of writing a book as you, you're building a house which someone wants to live in for a little while. Um, and this, seems to have been a haunted house. <laughs> I, I see you as someone who is genre-defying, um, but there has been a lot of discussion about the genre versus literature thing. Uh, you won um, South Africa's highest literary award, mm -hmm. uh, so for Shining Girls. Um, so in, in, we had um, Peter Temple win the Miles Franklin here, the crime writer winning the Miles Franklin, lifting, um, bringing genre into the literary field. How do you see yourself? Uh, 
because you, you'll be plonked in, in, a, in a, um, a crime writer convention one time, then a fantasy convention the next time, um, then you'll be sitting on the literary board the next. Where do you, where do you see yourself? You know, I think these genre wars are artificial and I think it does a disservice to readers um, because I think we should be promiscuous in our reading taste and we should take whatever book we want to bed with us. Um, and I just find it frustrating. I find it frustrating to be categorized to be kind of, I understand it's for marketing and I understand it's for the bookstores and it helps to sell books, but I'm, I read so widely I, I don't want to fit into any one particular category. Um, and I like being able to do a literary festival one week and you know, um, the Latitude Music Festival the next, and then go to the Harrogate Crime Writers Associate, you know, festival, and to be able to like cross those genres, and that it feels more reflective of my taste as a person, and I think a lot of people's tastes are actually quite wide open. You're not only um, a promiscuous reader, but uh, you don't keep to any media. You cross from TV, film, um, graphic novels, short stories, novels, you're all over the place. It's because I'm a little bit of a hustler, um, <laughs> and I think, I think that's why Detroit resonated so much, is I think Johannesburg and you know, where I grew up, it's a city of hustlers. You make do, and if you're going to make a living from writing, you've got to be able to play in different media. Um, but it is, it is also, and I learned different things from different things. I've learned so much an eye for journalistic detail and, and an ear for dialogue from the journalism I did. And I've learned how to do short, pacey scenes that are very visual from working in animation and comics. Because some poor bastard is going to have to draw that. <laughs> <laughs> so you better be able to explain it really clearly. And when you see the future of the novel, um, or the, the future of your, your writing as, as well, yeah. uh, where, where will it go? Are we talking gaming? Are we, like, where do you think it's going to head? Um, I don't think the novel as a format is ever going to change. I think we might see gimmicky novels, uh, choose your own adventures, or things where you can play with the Kindle and reorder the chapters in any way. I would have loved to do that with The Shining Girls, which of course jumps across multiple timelines. And it would have actually been great if you could have a slider bar to be able to reorganize the whole book according to different, you know, to be able to follow the killer's timeline or to be able to follow the actual historical timeline and read it in that order. Yeah. Um, but I think ultimately those are gimmicks and, and they're fun, but story is story. And we want to be told a story in a solid medium and whether that's ebook or paper, whether you can add cool gimmicks, it, it, it's not going to take away from the key story. Well, I've got you here. Um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about Shining Girls. Um, for, for readers who haven't haven't heard of it or read it yet, which, uh, why not? Um, why not? <laughs> um, can you just give us a little bit of a, um, a summary of, of, of the book? It's, it, well, that one's very easy to pitch. It's about yeah. a time-traveling serial killer. Um, but I didn't want to do Bill and Ted's excellent killing spree through time. <laughs> you know, stopping in the Paleolithic days and then kind of killing Hitler and medieval and then the space vixens in the year 3000. Um, I'm really interested in social issues in my work and, 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 and talking about who we are in the world right now. And history is so much part of that. So it's kind of between 1929 and 1993, I stopped before the internet because the internet would be very excited about evidence of a time traveling serial killer and would help to solve the case and I couldn't have that. Um, so it's, it's about how the 20th century has shaped us and how the American century has shaped who we are right now and the same mistakes we keep making, like the depression and the recession um, McCarthyism and the Red Scare and, and how they use exactly the same tactics in the war on terror to justify surveillance and people ratting each other out and it's, it's really interesting to see and you know the fact that woman, a woman's right to control her own body is still an issue today yeah. even though Roe vs. Wade passed in like the 70s it's just horrifying um, and I wanted to subvert the serial killer genre and make it much more about the victims to make it about these shining women yeah. um, and because too often female victims in, in serial killer books, they're there to be pretty corpses. They're there to be a bloody puzzle for the detective to solve and we never know anything about who they were or how they mattered in the world. Um, so it was really to kind of build up these lives of these women who were making a small difference in their own way, um, who were kind of shining lights in their community, not going to be the next president of the USA, but you know, people who were fighting convention and got killed for it. I mean, I, I think it's very important these days for the for the novel to to bring those issues um, to the to the, the, the contemporary mind because those kinds of juxtapositions between the, the depression and, and our period now and, and the the fight that it took for women's rights Absolutely. and then sort of and using the novel as a as a sugar coated pill is one beautiful way of of doing that. People don't realise they're getting all that info Absolutely. and forming new opinions maybe um, through through a story. Well, stories are empathy. And stories allow us to experience um, other lives. 
Um, and it's so it is so important. I mean, it's not it's not a historical treatise and it's not a feminist treatise. Yeah. It is first and foremost a novel, yeah. um, and hopefully a really great story which will carry you through. But if I can use it as a way of talking about the things which I'm really passionate about, and to show you connections that maybe you hadn't put together, that's awesome. That makes my job totally worthwhile and, and very very fun. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks so much, John. Lauren's books are available from booktopia.com.au.